Welcome to Completely Electrical's design series. Um, this is my $4 STEM show. The reason why it's called that, I ain't spending a penny. Um, I haven't got any money, so don't expect any thrills or uh, video editing classics, because I just can't do it. Anyway, design series. There's a lot to consider, it's a massive topic. Um, you might not get everything out of these videos. They're more for revision and, you know, a refresher maybe or just an overview of what cable design is all about. Uh, but nonetheless, I'll do my best. It's mainly for my apprentices, if I'm honest. Um, they tend not to listen too much in class and hopefully this will top up their knowledge. Anyway, the first video up is design current. Um, it's really important to get this right. It is the start of everything. Unless you know how much current you need in your circuits, you can't divide the circuits, you can't decide your insulation, your containment, are your protective devices. Um, so it's where we start. Um, there's not much more to say. Design Current is video number one. Every single appliance needs a certain amount of current in order just to operate. Ta -da! So what's the design current? Well, it's just the natural amount of current the circuit needs to operate. Just like a river needs a certain amount of water to flow. Whee! Yeah, I tried to do a documentary style, but failed to factor in the fact that I'm useless at video editing. So I scrap that for now. Um, so what's design current? It's just what the circuit needs in order to operate. So if it's a lighting circuit, it's what the lights need in order to operate, uh, minus a bit of diversity, talk about that later. Um, same with the cooker, it's what the cooker needs, minus a bit of diversity. Um, it's if you're putting in a shower, then it's what the shower needs in order to operate. It's just what the circuit needs in order to run day to day. It's exactly what we're expecting. You know, there's no surprises here. We can calculate this really easily. Um, there's a few things that you need to know, but it's nothing um, strenuous or stressful. Um, it's precisely what we're expecting from the circuit. This is exactly what we are expecting. I bet I'd make a great Bond villain. Precisely what we are expecting. It was the design currents we was expecting. Yeah, so I lost the bet. Anyway, point is, the design current is simply what our appliance or our circuit needs in order to operate. I think that's silly enough and uh, thorough enough for you to all understand what design current is. So, let's have a look at how we can work this out for different types of loads or circuits. So let's have a look at how to calculate these. So first slide up is resistive load. This is pretty straightforward. It's um, what you'd recognize uh, from the power equation. Uh, so the manufacturer will give you a data plate. And on that data plate, there'll be a wattage and a voltage. And you simply take the wattage divided by the voltage and get your design current. That's straightforward. So if we had a water heater, maybe an immersion heater, uh, that's stated at 3000 watts at 230 volts, we just say 3000 watts divided by 230 volts gives you 13.04 amps of design current. And that's the um, current we would use to start designing our cable. Socket outlets, a bit different. We never know what they're gonna plug in. So it's just the protective device rating. That's what we use as a design current. So if we've got a 16 amp circuit breaker protecting our circuit, maybe a radial, uh, then our design current is 16 amps. And if we're using a 32 amp uh, protective device, maybe a ring circuit or a four mil radial, then 32 amps is our design current. So quite straightforward then. 
Discharge lighting. Now these are fluorescent lights, uh, metal halides, anything with a old school ballast in, um, which is effectively an inductor. Um, the only difference really is the 1.8 factor that we have to put in um, to take into consideration the power factor of these lights, uh, which causes some inrush currents. Um, and if we didn't allow for that, then our cables would be undersized, uh, our switches would be undersized, etc. So it assumes a power factor of 0.85. So if it's massively less than that, and it, it probably isn't going to be nowadays, in fact, most of the light manufacturers, you know, they're up 0.95s um, plus actually. So it's not, it's not a massive um, concern, but use the 1.8 if it's 0.85 um, or more. So we just add up the total power of the lights, times it by the 1.8 power factor. It's not a power factor, it's a factor. Divided by the voltage. And that'll give us our design current. So, for example, if we have six 77 watt lights, um, the maths would be six times 77 times the 1.8 divided by the voltage. And that'll give us our design current. So we'd have a design current of 3.61 amps. Now, onto inductive loads such as single phase induction motors. You will need to know the power factor. Uh, the manufacturers give you that. It's normally on the data plate where we find all of our characteristics that we use to do our design. Um, and it's just the watts divided by the voltage times that power factor. Now the power factor is going to be a number between 0 and 1. Hopefully it's about 0.85 or more. Um, otherwise, you know, it's, it's just kind of wasteful, really, and you, everything has to get bigger to cope with it. Um, so it's not ideal. So let's do another example. Let's say we've got 6,000 uh, watt or 6 kilowatt single phase induction motor, which is rated at 230 volts. And that has a cosine theta or power factor of 0.85. Then the maths would simply be 6,000 watts divided by 230 volts times our power factor, which would give us 30.69 amps. And that would be our design current. Three phase, slightly different. Uh, the equation is the power divided by U times the square root of three times the power factor. Now on, on the slide I've put 400 volts because that is the UK's U at the moment. Um, it does vary slightly but uh, we allow those tolerances and uh, that's like our nominated voltage and the single phase UO line voltage to earth is 230 volts in the UK. So 400 times root 3, what's all that about? Well, it's to get essentially three single phases. Um, but it's not quite uh, accurate enough if you just do 230 volts times 3, and that's all down to the sine waves. Um, and I'm not going into that on this video. So it's 400 times root 3 times power factor. Okay. So let's just go over the example and put in uh, the differences between the single phase and the three phase. So let's say we've got a three phase induction motor rated at six kilowatts. Uh, it'd be 6,000 watts divided by 400 volts times root three times the 0.85 power factor. And that gives us 10.19 amps. Now if we just compare the two, single phase and three phase, both six kilowatts, um, it's essentially sharing the load between the three phases. And that's the main benefit of three phase really. You end up getting you know, slightly smaller cables and switch gear, uh, which is always a benefit, um, especially because three phase normally in factories and 
the only reason they're there is to make money. So they don't want to pay out excess money on bigger cables and switch gear. Right, so let's talk about that diversity thing that I whispered earlier. Diversity is an engineer's assumption based on the predicted actual usage of your circuit. Now, let's think about that for a second while I check the camera. Let's talk about diversity because it is something that needs to be considered. In a domestic house, it's not really going to benefit that much. Um, it will a bit on like a large electric cooker because um, you're not going to use all four rings and the oven and the grill all the time. And so we kind of take a gamble <laughs> that you're not going to use all of it all the time. Sometimes, you know, that's fine. Most of the time that's fine actually. But as I say, it's not a massive benefit in domestic. As you go further up the scale though, diversity becomes really important. So if you're designing a block of flats, um, if you don't allow a bit of diversity for each flat, you know, and assume an actual maximum demand rather than just the service cutout fuse, which is what a lot of electricians do, uh, then you're going to end up with huge cables and huge switch gear that will never be used. You know, and you can look up uh, data from National Grid and suppliers, and they can prove that the actual demand isn't what you might think. You know, we see that 100 amp cutout at the source of the supply, and you think, well, that must be the maximum demand. Well, it's the maximum potential, but the reality is nobody uses all of that at any one time. It's always split over different times of the day, which allows the cables to cool and everything's okay. So, you know, it gets more important the further up you go. It can be really important in factories because you could have really, you know, quite small supply gear um, and you can kind of tell them when to turn machines on and off and, you know, you can get really efficient with it. And that's obviously a benefit for any business. So. It is important, but if you're just doing domestic circuits, uh, personally, I, I don't apply it. And the reason why I don't apply it is because it's very difficult to predict the use in a domestic environment. You know, people live so diverse, hence the name, um, you, you can't predict in a domestic environment. In a business, you can. You can kind of lay down rules and uh, protocols and procedures. It's a lot easier to make sure everything's going to work okay. Because the worst case scenario with diversity, it's not that dangerous, it's just annoying because you'll end up undersizing you know, the cooker circuit and protecting that cable with a smaller device. And if they do want to use the full load you know, for a long, slow cooked meal, you know, it might trip out and that's you know, just annoying. Um, so for me, it's not for domestic, but you, know, you make your own mind up. As I say, it's an engineer's assumption. Um, as long as you can justify what you're doing, um, you know, it's okay. So there's some examples in the on-site guide of how to apply it for certain circuits and what not to apply it to. Um, that's table A2, I think, in the on-site guide. Uh, it's also in selection and erection, um, guidance note one, appendix H. I think that's right. <laughs> Appendix H is essentially the same table but all on one page. Also the IT do a design guide for you know bigger diversities when you're doing like a block of flats or houses, shops, those kind of things. Incidentally we don't apply as much diversity to a shop. You'll notice on them tables that domestic environment for a lighting circuit we can uh, use 66% of the full load whereas in a commercial environment we're only allowed, we have to use 90% of the full load. And that's down to the usage patterns. You know, it, you go into a shop, you turn all the lights on, you leave it all day. You know, so they are on most of the time. Uh, whereas at home, you know, as I say, everybody's got different usage. Um, you know, here's my actual usage of the flat. Um, I use hardly anything, you can see. And don't, don't judge because it's in crayon. <laughs> 
it's very accurate. <laughs> I've actually monitored it perfectly. Um, so the point is, you can apply diversity, and you know you should because we are trying to save the planet. And if we're not going to use all that copper, then you know you've got to be careful. Um, but it is an engineer's judgment, and if you're the engineer, then that's your judgment. Right, so that was a lot of talking. Um, let's just wrap things up. Firstly, I had a note at the beginning of the video saying that I was going to deliberately put a small error in just to test my students. So let's just clear that up first. It was when I said this. So if it's a lighting circuit, it's what the lights need in order to operate, uh, minus a bit of diversity. Talk about that later. You don't apply diversity to a final lighting circuit. Um, so let's run through the rules um, and just wrap these up with some statements. So to calculate your design current for a final circuit, you use the equations that we went through at the beginning. Then if you want to see about diversity, can you apply diversity, you use the rules in table A1 of the on-site guide. If you're calculating maximum demand for a fuse board, or maybe a property, house or a flat, um, then you use the rules in table A2 of the on-site guide. So you would take the circuit's design currents, apply those rules, then add them all up, that's your maximum demand. Incidentally, a submain is very similar because a submain's design current is the maximum demand. So that's how you'd get there. So I've done an example, um, it's just a couple of tables taking you through you know, an example kind of flat or a block of flats. Um, it is just an example, you can't really use that in the real world, you've got to do your own uh, judgment and assessment, I'm not going to be held responsible for any designs uh, unless you pay me for it. Um, so have a look at them tables, pause it, disassemble it, take it apart, etc. Um, there's more guidance to this in uh, selection and erection guidance note one, um, the IET's design guide, and you know, just, just be aware that domestic is not a big deal, but the further up the scale you go, the more important it gets. I mean, a national grid couldn't exist if we hadn't applied diversity. It would be too expensive. The cables would be gigantic and impossible to manage. So I hope you've enjoyed this. I hope you learned something. If you've got any questions, then do feel free to get in touch. I'll do my best to answer them all. Um, but yeah, take care. All right, just once more, let's just go through design current. See ya. The amount of current that the appliances are gonna be pulling. So it's normal uh, surface current. What the equipment needs in order to operate. So we're not talking about fault currents, we're not talking about overload currents, we're talking about day-to-day -day running of the equipment. How much current does this stuff actually need? So if you're designing a lighting circuit, then you need to add up all the lights. That'll be your design current. If you're designing an electric hob circuit, then it's what the hob needs to operate. If you're designing a water heater circuit, like an immersion heater, then it's what current the immersion heater needs to operate. These are all the design currents. So it's the current that the circuit is going to need to operate.
It's good. Is that it? It's good, amazing and fat. <laughs>